hold on remove save changes all right we're live <laughs> hello hello we have a packed show for you this evening if you've been paying attention you already know that the cops that um killed brianna taylor pretty much were not charged we're going to be talking about that also, if you've been paying attention, you know that the number of coronavirus deaths in the U.S. is now at 200,000, and yet this virus keeps getting politicized. In the last 24 hours, this is still a developing story, um, it's been circulating that there were discarded ballots that were supposed to be cast for Trump in Pennsylvania. Now, the DOJ has launched an investigation, and this is the fastest the DOJ has launched an investigation. We're going to be talking about that as well. And having political conversations can be difficult. That's the topic of tonight's show. And if you're like me, you want to get some tips on how you can still have these hard conversations and still have friends and still have your family <laughs> members around, we'll be discussing all this and much more with my guest today, Nicole Vick who has 12 years of teaching experience. She is currently an adjunct professor in the Urban and Environmental Policy Department at Occidental College and has taught at Cal State, Asheville University, and the University of Phoenix. That resume that I read is just a little bit. She has a big resume, and I hope that you saw what I posted about her. Welcome to the show. Welcome. I'm so excited to be here. I'm, I'm ready to jump right into this conversation because... <laughs> We got a lot to talk about. <laughs> we got a lot to talk about. It's a packed show. And welcome, yes. my name is Obi, and this is the News with Obi, where we talk about all things politics, current affairs happening in our local community and around the world. <laughs> All right, all right, let's dive right into it. So, Nicole, we know that Trump is saying he will announce the Supreme Court pick by the end of the week. Sources are saying that he intends to pick um, Amy Barrett. I don't know much about her as of yet. But why is it important that the Senate holds off on filling RGB's um, seat till after inauguration? In my opinion, there are several reasons. Um, first of all, I find it really ironic that when it, the tables were turned and it was the other way around, right. people were like, no, you know, we, ha we have to do this right now or no, we have to wait. And now all of a sudden there's this fast forward and I'm like, what is going on? Um, so the hypocrisy to me right now is feeling real, real, real wrong for me. Yeah. The yeah. second thing that I think is really important is at least from a public health perspective, from my my training, I have 15 years of experience working in public health for a local health department. And I feel like the folks that are currently in the, in, in the White House do not have a, a, a social justice public health frame of mind. And mm. we have seen that play out with COVID. And I feel like if we if this happens, I think we're going to be in trouble. We're going to see some of the very important things that we hold um, dear and that we tend to take for granted in regards right. to some of the protections that we have in this country, yeah. I think we're going to see them go away. Yeah, Roe v. Wade is on the table. A lot of things are on the table that is pretty scary. You know, right. a, lot of, a lot of the rights that we have now as women is, you know, given to our BG fighting, you know. So, yes. and quite honestly, Trump does have the power to really put somebody in there. But let's yeah. just hope Democrats fight back and help. Mo hopefully, he'll hold off. They are going to have to have the fight of their lives. I know they're going. They're talking about some stalling tactics that they can kind of put into play. I'm like, y'all going to have to stall like you have never stalled before. I don't know what you're going to have to do. Please yeah. do it, whatever. It is. Yeah, yeah, whatever it is. This is this is uh, important. Like everything. Very. I mean, the United States really, the Supreme Court makes all the decisions. You know, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, this is very important because those decisions that those judges well before Trump, you know, well after Trump is gone, they're they still there. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, let's keep our fingers crossed. Pray and fast, you guys. Whatever we got to do. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to cross my eyes. I, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> now let's get to the next one. I know this is your, you know, particularly your field is um urban and environmental policy. So a recent report in Bloomberg. Um, stated that North, Norfolk, Virginia actually leveraged federal tax breaks to demolish black neighborhoods. I had no idea that was going on. And this is purely gentrification at its finest. As an adjunct professor in urban and environmental policy, I figured this would be a fitting question for you. Talk to us about that. So one thing that people don't realize is that public health is a prevent is about prevention of, of disease in communities, but we also have a social justice framework as well. And actually housing is a public health issue. We tend to think of housing, oh, you know, people can afford housing and put them in and not make them homeless, but there's a public health frame to housing. And so gentrification, in my pers- in my opinion, and from the public health perspective, is a bad thing. And there's a a number of reasons why, but I want to tell you some stories about gentrification that have happened in my neighborhood that may kind of help you see um, where where things happen or how these things happen. So just the other day, Mm -hmm. I saw on Facebook a house for sale in my neighborhood. One point two five million dollars. Wow. I bought my house for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars ten years ago. Wow. So you mean it, that's a huge, huge. increase. Um, yeah. Huge. Yeah. And on the on the one hand, you know, some people are like, yes, because that now means my house is gonna be worth more. If that house sells for asking, my house is gonna be worth more. Yay, right? right. But there are so many people that I know personally that are educated, that have really good jobs, that cannot afford to live in these communities like mine. And I live in South Central Los Angeles, okay? Let me give you some perspective on where I live. I live four blocks away from where Nipsey Hussle was killed, okay? So we're talking about South LA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a house for $1.25 million. Yeah. The question that always comes to my mind is, who's going to be able to afford that? Who in this neighborhood that lives here now, that was born and raised here, can now afford to live in a house that costs that much money? You are effectively shutting out Yes. The community pushing out the yes. community um, and they're not able to benefit from all the amenities that sort of follow with gentrification, the Starbucks and all right. the good things. We all get pushed out of the community. We can't enjoy it. And right. it just is such an unfair thing. Right. Right. So, I mean, what Norfolk, Virginia is actually doing, even using federal tax dollars. Is that even legal? I don't even know. Um, but you know, historically there have been things like that, that have happened, yeah. you yeah. know, block busting, redlining, redlining yeah. was something that was sanctioned by yeah. the government. It wasn't just something that came out of the air. So exactly. it doesn't surprise me, um, that funding, federal funding was used to, to effectively reshape neighborhoods and move people of color, black people out of their neighborhood. It's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. I, it's, it's so bad for me. I worked in a community um, not far from my home. Again, another low income black and Latino community. They got a Starbucks Mm. and everybody cheered. Yay, we can go to Starbucks now. I was the only one that was sad because I knew what that meant. Right. The the housing prices are going to go up. We're going to see the neighborhood shift. Yeah. And, you know, know, like, why, what can, is there anything we can do? to prevent these businesses from coming to our neighborhoods and pushing us out? It's really hard because I think, unfortunately, I think there's been many studies that show the black dollar, right? Um, the, the value of a black family is so much lo- much more lower than uh, the value of a white family, their net worth. So right. we often don't have the capital to even yeah. go in and try to buy or to try to save the neighborhood by buying up the properties. And right. unfortunately, what happens is, you know, um, and not to blame grandma, or um, someone that's retiring, they, on the one hand, they have the right to sell their house for more money than they paid for it and to yeah. benefit from that. Right. But often it comes at a cost because these investors buy these properties, fix them and flip them, and then they get to be so expensive, no one can access them in the neighborhood. And everybody is like, what are we supposed to do? Yeah. Um, so outside of trying to find that capital um, to try to buy up some of these properties um, or figuring out some legislation or policies that will kind of, you know, 
help people with um, down payments or something like that? I, I really, I honestly don't know. Um, but there needs to be a, some sort of change in how we think about housing in this country so yeah. that people that are from the community can stay here. There's an organization in Watts and they say better neighborhoods, same neighbors. I should be able to stay in my community um, and not have to leave in search of better. It sh we should have it here. And so that's something that I really, really hold close to me. Like we should be able to stay here. Yeah. But it's yeah. just, it's hard. Um, I have uh, one of my friends, she's here at four. She's saying, hello, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. So I'm going to ask this next question and you, you know, since so the viewers can keep listening and I, you know, I told you I was going to have to bust somebody. <laughs> in. So as a public health advocate, right. Talk yes. to us about the adverse effects of mixing politics and science like COVID-19 has been politicized. Well, you know what? I need to be on this conversation. So hold that. Let me hold that. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> We're going to wait for her. She got to take care of something real quick. Um, but yeah, the, polit the politicization of public health has been a really interesting thing. We, I don't know what happened and it's very disappointing. I was just giving them a little tidbit yeah, while you talk. You. I love you. Thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> So the um, interesting thing is um, a couple of weeks ago, I gave a lecture in class about the four controversies of public health. And one of them is politics versus science. Right. And the, co the other co coincidence is that this morning I watched a YouTube video, Trevor Noah and Dr. Right. Fauci talk about po getting politics out of public health. I said, oh, my goodness, this is so crazy that I'm seeing this video. And I literally just talked to my class about this. I probably will send that to them and make them do an assignment on it so they can understand that, that what the issue interview. is. That, that was a great interview. It was. And it was very true. So oftentimes, you know, public health is really about prevention of disease. I talked about that promotion of health in communities. So right. by its very nature, it's not political. Like we just want you to be healthy and to live a long and healthy life. That's it. We don't have no political leanings or anything in general. Um, but what has happened is, and I think Dr. Dr. Fauci talked about this, is that some of the recommendations and some of the mandates that have come out in regards to the pandemic, wear a mask, social distance, um, do these things, that thing, have become politicized because people are deciding to push against some of those recommendations and mandates. And he's like, we just want to keep people alive and safe and healthy. Right. These things should not be up for the political debate. Right. Um, and I think that's the danger. Like the, like um, the people that don't want to wear a mask, you know. It's people. like, we're not telling you to wear a mask because we just want you to look stupid. That's not why we're telling you to wear a mask. And we're we're literally it's, not, it's not taking away your freedom. It's right. trying to keep I remember, you alive. <laughs> I remember watching a film clip, and I believe it was in Florida. I don't know if you saw this, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong. They were in Florida, and, and it was some kind of like a city council meeting or something to that effect. And people were coming up for public comment saying something like, you're yeah. taking away my my right to breathe. I'm like, but you're breathing through the mask. The mask is not taking away your oxygen. <laughs> like, that. Yeah, that was funny. <laughs> they're literally cool. trying to save your life. And that's always been the goal. Right. Um, and the, the turning point for me is I saw a recent article, um, the former director of the LA County Department of Public Health, Dr. Jonathan Fielding wrote an article with someone else. I, I forgot who it was, but they were really concerned because what has been happening, at least here in, in, in California and in Southern California, is that some of the public health officials have been getting death threats. Oh, wow. Um, the, the Orange County uh, public health official resigned because they were they were threatening her life. And she was like, I have a family. I have children. Wow. She resigned. I think her name is Nicole. She ended up wow. resigning. And That's the crazy, crazy thing is, I said to myself, I said, oh, we're in L.A. That won't happen in L.A. Sure enough, uh, Dr. Barbara Ferrer did also receive death threats. And I'm like, why are people so angry against public health when ultimately we're really trying to save your life. And so right. I think that's where the scary part of this whole um, politics versus science comes in. You have governors right. and mayors that are like, we don't care. Don't wear a mask, whatever. This business as usual. Trump, going Trump against wearing a mask for the longest time. <laughs> and he was like, it'll just go away. He was like, it'll yeah. go away. 
Yeah. No, that's not how science works. That's not how disease works. Right. That's like telling somebody that has syphilis, oh, that's all right. You don't need to wear no condom. Go ahead. Never mind. Whatever. Yeah. You're going to give people syphilis. <laughs> That's, that's, not- a good, that's a good analogy right there. That's a good comparison. Like, yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, uh, are we, David, Fauci has not been wrong with predicting these things so far. Uh, do you think we're really going to get a second wave and how bad are we expecting this second wave to be? I think we're going to get a second wave. Um, I'm not sure how bad it's going to be. I think one of the one of the problems is that people are getting tired. They're getting fatigued with this whole pandemic. Mm-hmm. If if they haven't been um, specifically impacted individually, they don't know anybody that got sick or died. They, it's hard to really understand the impact or the 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 the, 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 the scope of the problem. Right. And so. I think we may see more deaths for sure. Then, mm-hmm. of course, now we're moving into seasonal flu season on top mm-hmm. of the COVID issue. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot going on. And if people are not willing to understand the science and are really trying to play politics with this thing, I think we're going to have a lot yeah. more issues coming moving forward. And it's going to be it's going to be bad. Yeah. So stay uh, inside, people. Wash your hands. Yeah. Put your mask on, please. Yeah. It's really not that difficult. It really isn't. It's it's it's, it's easy. So let's switch gears a little bit. Um, sure. Rihanna Taylor. Um, <sighs> only one out of the three officers were barely not even charged. You know, um, wanton in, um, in endangerment, firing into the apartment, um, not for homicide not for taking a black woman's life, not for taking an innocent life. What is your take on this? Well, I'm a black woman, as you can see, and I'm sure you understand how it feels yeah. to continuously get messages by the media, by society that say that our lives don't mean anything. Yeah. And how does that, it feels terrible. I have a daughter and how do I raise her in this society? She's 23, so she's an adult, but how do I kind of usher her into society um, knowing that ultimately we don't matter? Um, and I think that's the thing that on a human level is what really impacted me. Like once again, it is clear that our lives don't mean much. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's the, that's so hard, so hard. And I, I will say that that whole uh, wanton endangerment and how they just kind of, you know, got one of the officers kind of got in trouble. I feel like they had to make an example. That was kind of like, well, we got to do something. We can't just let y'all all all go because then that's just going, you know, the whole world is going to explode. Um, so we just gonna, you know, you're gonna have to catch the, you know, the, the, the fall on this one, but it's okay. You know, and that will get you out on parole. The one (laughs) on, um, endangerment was only a charge of five years. Yeah. Nothing. Right. And he probably won't go be in there for five years. He'll probably get parole or something crazy. So I I feel like they just made him an example to appease, you know, to some degree, the public, which is not, we not that stupid. Like, come on now. That's a slap in the face. Um, I do want to say one thing too, though, because I noticed this as well. People have been criticizing the family for taking that settlement money. Her life had value. I'm sorry. Right. Yes. And they should have probably gave her... Three it, times as much. Exactly. Right. Right. That's, right? That was nothing. That's not even enough. Right. So, so I, I have no criticisms on that. And I believe her life had value and she sh- her family should be compensated for that loss. You cannot ever replace that with that woman. But you know what? You sure can try to make it right by giving some money. But like yeah. you said, three, four times as much as what they gave is what they should have received. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really got to give it up to, um, 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 not even, um, the young people out there now protesting, I mean, they are not backing down. Like right. all over the country that same night, I even had a 22 year old running for office here in New York that was out, wow. I had to do the show, yeah. So they're really out there, really pushing it. They're trying to change the narrative and I really give it up to them. You know, yeah, uh, keep fighting you guys, keep protesting. They are gonna yes. have to hear our voices. They have to, they have no choice but to. 
absolutely. And I, I think like you, I love that young folks are out doing this because I always tell my students, I tell any young person I meet, you guys are going to have to be the one to figure this out, honey, because we yeah. done messed this all up. We don't, know. Yeah. <laughs> we don't yeah. know what we doing. We trying, but I think yeah. ultimately you will be the ones that will save this world and, and we need you. So I don't, I don't judge. I'm like, if you need to get out there and make a point, make a statement, please do it. Um, mm-hmm. And so, and, and to your point, if that means also running for office, do that too. Cause we need it on both sides. We need folks running for office and we need mm-hmm. folks out in the streets to protest because we have gotten to a point where I honestly am like, are we in the 1960s or 1950s that's what it, that's again? What it, that's what it's looking like. That's what it's feeling like. And again, that's why I like the group of young people right now out there doing it they are not they remind you of the mlk era you know yes but the fact also that black people in this country are still fighting since then it 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 brings me to tears every time i even talk about it like why do we i was on i was in dc because i'm from dc area i went to the march on washington and that was powerful even though it wasn't nearly it was packed but if not for COVID, there would have been more people, but people came from all over. And yeah. you know, I'm like, why do we keep, why is it 60 something years later? Why are we still talking about the same thing? You know? Absolutely. I had that same thought too. I thought about my great grandparents who I actually had the privilege, um, ble- so blessed to have them in my life for as long as I did. I think I was about 19 when my great grandmother died. Oh, she wow. was almost hundred years old. Wow. And I, I had a thought the other day, I said, they would be turning in their graves to know mm-hmm. that in 2020, yeah. that this is still yeah. going on stuff that yeah. they, you know, my great grandmother was born in 1898 in Tennessee. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I, I can only imagine what she saw yeah. um, and, yeah. and lived through. And wow. if she could even just know that yeah. all this is still happening, men are still hanging, black men are still hanging from trees and, and still getting shot by police like what what did we what was all this for if we still are in the same space it just it's just so um disheartening um yeah. but i will say this i think people keep saying and i said this on a, one of my instagram videos the other day people keep saying the system is broken the system is broken i said hold on the minute i need you to understand the system is not broken the mm. system is working as it is intended to work it's right. just the fact that it was not intended for black it, people. No, it was not. It and was once not. you understand that, you will see things differently. This system I, was I, not I, intended I, for I, us. I need, say, I need you to say that again because <laughs> we need to make sure people are hearing this. Please tell us that again. The system was not intended for us. It, yeah. it is working as it was intended but the, the wrinkle is that it wasn't intended for us, okay? Yeah. And yeah. so once we realize that, we can now move differently within this society when you realize that, like, oh, wait a minute, this isn't for us. Yeah. Um, and our job, and it doesn't mean just kind of sit back, oh, well, the job is we have to dismantle it and rebuild right. it. Right. And you know, the oppressor will never um, want a system that benefits them to be messed with. So that's right. why- we keep fighting and I know is disheartening, but we just have to keep fighting. I mean, keep, if, yeah. if, if the system is benefiting then why would they want it to change? And that's why they right. keep pushing back too, you know? Exactly. So, um, yeah. So Afua I had made a comment earlier, she was saying, um, yeah, we're not for sale. She was talking about the money, um, that right. Brianna people took and she said the money can bring her back. Yeah, we agree. It's, um, it's a shame that people will even say that about, about the family. You know, right, so right. Say that when they're not personally affected. Exactly, and 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 you're right. The money won't bring her back, but guess what? That money can do. That money can um, uplift her family economically. They can buy property. Yeah. They can open businesses. They can open create a foundation to help other people that are uh, impacted by crime. So no, that money will never bring her back. But that money can definitely elevate her family and her community um, mm-hmm. in ways that they probably could not have done before. So. So in, yeah. in one sense, it's like it can't bring her back, but it will it will mean yeah. that her death was not in vain yeah. um, because there can be so much more that can be done. Um, yeah. You know, unfortunately, that we, we can't bring her back. But, yeah. hey, you're going to pay for that. You're going to pay for her, her life and value. They have, yeah. they have to pay. There's a time they need to be held accountable. And quite honestly, based on, you know, uh, for a lot I and I might be wrong, but I honestly think as black people, when it comes to the justice system, because of we've been pushing back 
little by little progress has been happening, you know, um, yeah. it, it's not as quick, but it is happening. Right. So right. It means we might not even be around to see a whole change, but at least uh, something is going on. Yeah. Right. Beginning to plant those seeds. Yeah. Right. And yeah. like you said, maybe we're not here, but we yeah. start the seed planting and then the next generation picks up from there and keeps going. Yeah. I just, you know, and I think we're, we're, we're there, we're there. Yeah. And it's just unfortunate that we have to lose people like that um, in order to get something to change um, yeah. and, and get things to happen. I think that's the part that's like, yeah. And I'm going to segue into um, the next question. I'm going to actually jump to the November 3rd question about voting. People like your great-great-grandmother um, fought, you know, to see that we're voting today. Talk to us about yes. people who say their vote doesn't count. November 3rd is right around the corner. We can't keep saying that right now. Talk to us about we that. We can't. We can't keep saying that. We cannot afford. We cannot right. afford. Okay? Right. It's not even about preference. We cannot afford to have that thought process yeah. at this time because I feel like we are in a fight for our lives so right. you know we need all hands on deck and I've heard this before I'm sure you've heard this before if our vote didn't matter why they try so hard to keep us from doing it exactly they try hard it's they will close hard. that polling place <laughs> they'll you know put they two polling places <laughs> yeah they do all kind of stuff. They make you do, uh, if you are felon, you got to do this. You got to pay this. You got to go get an ID. So if they didn't, if voting didn't matter, well, they sure make it hard to do. Um, yeah. So you might want to think about that. Like, hmm, that must mean that it's, this is a big deal. Um, yeah. And so, I, and I understand why people would say, I don't want to vote. I mean, come on now. <laughs> we continue to be disappointed all the time yeah, know, um, with with what happens to us. Yeah, so I, yeah. I understand, but it's yeah. like I still need you to I still need you to do this. I need right. you to do this. right because it still makes a difference. Um, just like filling out your census ballot, like I tell people, yes. that still that definitely makes a difference. People, I had somebody in a show one time that said um, they don't think the money is being properly allocated to the communities. Um, yeah, <laughs> Census yeah. matters. And I, you know, I know a lot of immigrants are kind of scared to fill it out, but they did not. The question about, um, if you are an American citizen was defeated in court, they ended up not yes. putting it on the ballot. So, right. That's the thing. So please fill out your census ballot, send that back. Um, however you're voting, you can vote early or in person. You can send in the mail-in ballot, even if it means you walk in it to the post office, just make sure you do it on time so that the yes. post office gets it to where it needs to be, especially if you live in the battleground states. I live in New York. New York is automatically blue. Um, right. So <laughs> they don't like Same to, with California, you know. California so. too, exactly. So please, it's all hands on deck. I'm even considering volunteering on that day, mm -hmm. um, because they need um, election poll people, so I'm I'm yeah. gonna see if my job can let me go <laughs> volunteer that day. And speaking of um, them doing whatever they need to do to stop us from voting, so in the last 24 hours, by the time you listen to this, we'll probably hear a little bit more about the story. But in the mm -hmm. last 24 hours, um, out of Pennsylvania, their Trump camp was saying that seven ballots were discarded. Um, uh, votes by the military and these were supposedly Trump votes and at first they said it was nine then they said it was seven and the DOJ has already launched an investigation like I've never seen the DOJ launch an investigation like soon. that so, yeah so I don't know what this is about with the, like I said the story is still developing I think is a another convenient lie for Trump yes. To continue to make these baseless claims of mail-in ballot being fraudulent. So, what what do you make of that? I, I'm sure we'll probably revisit this later. But what do you make of all that? Uh, again, to your point, I do think it is his attempt to try to discredit mail-in ballots. Yeah. He he's already said more or less that he ain't going out without a fight. That's that's what I heard from from what the <laughs> stuff that I've been seeing on the news. Like, dude, what are you talking about? Um, and I think all the more reason why we just need to be diligent about voting, about showing up. Um, 
even if you don't care about what happens in the White House, I'll say this too. There's other issues on the ballot that also are very important. Yeah. Here in Los Angeles County, there is a race for uh, one of the Board of Supervisors slots is, is vacant. You know, our county board of supervisors has a lot of power. That yes. probably more powerful than you know what happens in the White House. We'll see more directly. So right. it's like you gotta vote um, right. because there are other things that are going to happen in your neighborhood that will mean a lot. That if yeah. you don't put your, you know, and then you wonder what happened. Yes. Our district attorneys, you know, right. our judges, you know, right. and then you wonder why these cases go to court and people get to walk away. Did you look? Did you vote for the right judge? Yeah. <laughs> did yeah. you vote for the right, right. district attorney? Right. Right, right, right. That's important so, too. That is definitely important. Also, researching to see who's running in your community to see yeah. because on on election day you don't want to be guessing when you're either filling in the ballot or pushing the buttons. I know I want right. to vote early and in person, um, just so I can get it out the way. Um, but if you are not, if you're going out to vote, please mask up, take yes. hand sanitizer. If you got to take a chair to sit down to wait, whatever you got to do, um, just please, let's make sure we all go out and make this happen. Absolutely. And like you said, think back to when our grandparents and great grandparents was, was standing in whatever they were standing in, in the, in the dust and the dirt, yeah. whatever they were doing, trying to make sure their votes were in. I know you probably heard the stories where they had to prove they could read and write before yeah. they could even cast a ballot yeah. or didn't, if they didn't have the right ID, they yeah. couldn't go in. We okay. have to do, we got to do our due diligence this time. We can't, yeah. we can't just hope for the best. Oh, well, somebody else will take care of it. We can't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can. So our title today for this show is actually how to have hard political discussions. I mean, with elections coming up, talking about politics can be very difficult. And a lot of people have disconnected with family, lost friends over political views, have arguments. I know I've gotten to heated arguments on Facebook. I mean, yeah, I'm first generation Nigerian American, but I have people in Nigeria that support Trump, and it's a, it's a bizarre thing. They support Trump because they believe he's a Christian and they believe he's against gay rights. And I'm like, really? That's, that's, that's really what you're worried about? So I have those conversations on social media all the time. It's like I'm fighting with people. So <laughs> <laughs> help me out here. How do I have this dialogue without fighting? Because if they were face to face, I think it would be a whole different story. <laughs> Let me tell you. So you literally just outlined my whole life story because I was so shocked and surprised. I'm sure my parents will kill me if I if they hear this. But my parents also are, you know, very similar. They were like, no, we, we own Trump. That's our we, that's our man. And I'm like. Wow. I'm confused. Yeah. Um, and it has been difficult to the point where for me, um, I just decide, and, and at least in my family, I'm like, we just don't talk about it. We talk about the weather. We talk about how's, you know, how's everybody doing? And that's kind of where we stop because it's, it's not, it's, it gets very difficult to really try to, um, give someone a different frame of reference. Like, well, wait, that's not yeah. kind of, that's not what the reality know, is. Really how we express a lot, how we express how we feel about things, uh, uh, our social um, things that we talk about, yes. politics, you know. So yeah, with your family, none at all? No? I can't talk to them. But I do have, so I'll say this, I don't, I, I can't talk to my parents about it. I think it's better not to in this case. And that's just something I've like, you know what, I just, I can't. Um, because I think honestly, my mama thinks I'm some kind of like social justice warrior. Like she's like, I don't, what are you doing over there? You know, <laughs> that's okay. We just don't talk about it. Um, but I did write an article for Authority Magazine. And, and in that article, I did give some tips on how to broach difficult conversations, mostly okay. around social justice issues, but politics can kind of fit into there. Yeah, and, and one of the things I, I, I did talk about was the importance of leading with the heart. Right. And 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 looking for that common ground. I think oftentimes when you can meet someone in a common space um, mm -hmm. around a specific issue, it's easier to move forward. So, for instance, um, if you're having a conversation, you can say something like, well, do you agree that everyone mm -hmm. should have the opportunity to live a healthy life? Most people will agree with you on that. I don't know anyone would say no, you know, oh, well, most people will say, yeah, everybody, everyone should have the chance to live a healthy life. So you start there and then you can kind of start to layer on top of that. Well, 
Do you think that there's some people in this country that don't have the same opportunity? And you can go and they, they may say yes, or they may say no, but then you can kind of have this conversation. Well, why do you think that is? And, and, and kind of build on that. So I often tell people to kind of start at a main point where everyone will agree. Now, if they disagree with that, I, then I don't know what to tell you. Because <laughs> I mean, there may be some people that disagree, but you do know that for the most part, people are reasonable and they yeah. think that everyone should have a chance to do that the best that they can in this country, right? So you start yeah. there and then you move forward. So that was one thing that I, that I said in that article, to start with your heart and kind of find that common ground and move from there. Yeah. The other thing I talked about is you do have to be okay with being a little firm and calling people out, like, hold on, you yeah. know, especially when the conversation starts to go in the direction of, you talked about gay marriage and things like that, where people want to disparage um, folks for what they believe and who they are. Hold yeah. on, you know, that's where yeah. you may have to get a little bit stern. That's not acceptable. You know, in my house, that's not how we talk about people. Um, yeah. the, you know, we respect people despite their differences and opinion, um, and even if you don't agree with something, don't you agree that people in this in America, based on independence and the the, 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 the desire to be left alone, should have the right to yeah. do as they please. So you yeah. sometimes have to kind of navigate um, yeah. and kind of take people around the bend on some things. Yeah. Right. Um, right. But you, I think if you start from the heart, um, yeah. you might have a better chance. You still might get kind of get that pushback, but at least you've made your thoughts and opinions known like you may not agree with me but at least you know where i stand um and that's kind yeah. of the yeah i think that's well, the only way only thing that works because when you come to people with facts well that's not true blah 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 what we found is the more you try to discredit someone's thoughts with evidence numbers stats that that yeah. actually doesn't yeah. change people's minds they right. hold tighter to their yeah. beliefs in the face of anything that discredits that belief. So it doesn't work to do that. Right, right. And Michelle is saying, leading with the heart has been underrated. Thank you for that perspective. So yeah. okay, that, so pretty much you're telling me I got to be patient with these people? <laughs> I, I mean, that, <laughs> that's pretty much what you're saying. I, I, got, I mean, I'm listening to you. I'm not in my head. I'm like, she's really saying, uh, and I'm going, has she seen the comments they make? Like, how am I supposed to be that patient? <laughs> now, I will say this. If you value the relationship, yes. If you don't care, you can just be like, look, y'all crazy and just, you know, cuss them out or whatever. But if you really want to try to have yeah. a relationship or you really want to try to help them see a different perspective, yeah, you're going to have to be a little patient. <laughs> so you're going to take a pill or get you a drink in advance. I don't know, but you <laughs> get yourself ready. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So I understand, you know, the facts because I always come with the facts. I always make sure that I've read up on a lot. So I'm coming at you with blah, blah. These are the facts. So I understand how that doesn't work. But it, leading with the heart, what about people that are not compassionate? What about people yeah. that... Look, in public health, this is this is how we are, we are trained. So I can't... It, it's better for me to spend my time trying to educate someone that is unsure, right? They're not okay. sure which way they want to go. That's right. what I'm going to focus my efforts on. If okay. you're so strongly opposed that right. nothing I say matters, I, I can't waste my time on you because I exactly. can't help you. Okay. So okay. if this is a matter of a vaccination or a matter of, I don't know, it could be anything public health related, seatbelt laws or something. If yeah. you are adamant about not wearing a seatbelt, I will not. I can't waste my time on right. you because right. I could be talking to the family with the young child about their car seat. Right. And, right. and, and they, they need help figuring out how to do that. I'm best served to help that family figure that out than to try right. to convince this person that is so adamant that they know. I, so, I so, can't, what can so I do? Pretty much don't argue with Trump supporters because people from a distance can tell who is who. <laughs> All right. Got it. That is my takeaway from this. Do not argue <laughs> with Trump supporters because you can't get anywhere with that. So... All right, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you guys got, got you know, took um, notes on the test, but definitely leading from the heart. That's a big one. Thank you for that. Yes. So yes. what other projects are you working on? I know you're a very busy person. 
What other products are you working on? How can our viewers, you know, assist? How can we help? Can we follow, support you? Are you running for office anytime soon? Do we need to Because we need more black women in office, you know, right? Yes, we do. You are right about that. Um, there's an organization, just a side plug, Higher Heights, I believe it is, that is focused on getting more Black women into office. Um, there's a lot of fellowships, the Women's Policy Institute, um, the Los Angeles African American Women's Policy Institute that, try, that train women uh, for public office. And I've done some fellowships and things and I have considered it, but I'm like, I don't know if I'm built for it because I was a commissioner for about five years um, and I chaired the commission for two years. Right. And the first time somebody cussed me out and I couldn't cuss back, cuss back at them because, you know, I'm at the front. I have to be official. Right, right, right. You know, I was like, I don't know if I'm cut out for this because I can't respond <laughs> the way that I want to. Right. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I think I might just need to help people get into office. Um, There's a county, the woman that's running for a second district supervisor here in L.A. County, Senator Holly Mitchell. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, can I just give you some money and, and, and support your campaign? I don't know if I'm cut out for this life, um, but I, I definitely I mean, love I mean, supporting. Well, consider, down, down the line, you know, a lot of people that go into running for office, they say they never really considered it. They never really, you know, wanted to do it, but, you know, they're good at it. So I've, That's seen, true. Your, I've seen your work. So I, I think you should, you know, really consider it. You know, we'll like, see. Yeah. I mean, and also you've trained people to do it. So why not? Yeah. We'll yeah. see one day, maybe we'll, we'll see. Um, but so far I've been really just, you know, chugging away at this day job. COVID-19 has definitely shifted my work on a day-to-day -day basis. I went from running a program focused on health literacy to literally running a COVID-19 uh, call center. Um, oh, totally wow. different scope of work, but yeah. it's been amazing because I now have a new, you know, body of experience. Yeah. Um, and, and the interesting thing about this hotline is that we are now starting to see um, some of the ills of society being amplified by this pandemic. You know, uh, people getting sick and don't have health insurance mm -hmm. and don't know what to do. They're scared about losing their jobs. Yeah. They don't have access to food. And so those things are really taking up a lot of my time. Um, and as I mentioned, um, I'm teaching. So I'm an adjunct professor and yeah. everything is online. So I'm on Zoom talking to my students, which feels so impersonal you know i'm so used to being in class and looking yeah. them in the eye you know are yeah. you paying attention to me? <laughs> i can't tell yeah. yeah exactly yeah but i find ways to engage with them um and, and hopefully you know i i think i'm it's it's i'm resonating with them because i often bring my work to class so yeah. i teach them something that's abstract or foreign but i'm like and at work today this is what i did Right. Or this is how this plays out in reality. So I always try to do that with them. So the day job, the teaching, um, doing podcasts, speaking to people such as you, trying to get the word out about public health and social justice. Um, I wrote a book. Yes. Uh, yes. And that was that was a, a, a job yes. <laughs> in and of itself. Exactly. And Congrats. just Congrats. trying to push that out. Yeah. Thank you. And just really trying to get you know, the word out and, and push the book out to everyone as well. So I'm yeah, super busy. The, tell us about sure. the book. Sure. The book is called Pushing Through, Finding the Light in Every Lesson. And it is my life story. But what I did was I talked about some key moments in my life where I, I had to find that light and that lesson, baby, because it's a lot of lessons. Yeah. Um, but I also <laughs> talk about public health and okay. sort of some of the things that kind of popped up for me. Um, as I started to understand what public health and social justice was about. So even my journey as a teen mother, for example, um, at, at USC, I'm at a, a predominantly white institution, a black woman from South Central LA, pregnant, um, trying to navigate this institution and this, this, this social structure that yeah. was not intended for me, right? right. USC wasn't in, intended for black people. When they built wow. USC in 1880, I don't think they was thinking about black folk walking through these halls. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a quote that I say often that I found a little while ago. When you are existing in a society that's not built for you, just yeah. showing up is the revolution, right? So uh, even just me being on that campus with yeah. my baby that's in a thing. stroller, yeah. <laughs> going to yeah. class, yeah. I didn't think I was being a revolution, but I but was. You were. Yeah, yeah. You were debunking yeah. myths just being there. Right, you know? 
Um, and I was able to push through. People were telling me you should drop out. College advisor saying, hey, you should take a leave of absence. And I'm like, why? Why? Why, why are you telling me? Why are you trying to cut me short? You know, yeah. why are you trying to do me like this? When yeah. when knowing dang on well, if I leave, the likelihood of me coming back and finishing is slim to none. Right. Don't, don't do me like that. Right. You know, <laughs> and, and thankfully yeah. I knew better. I knew <laughs> even in my ignorance as a teen mom, 18, 19 years old, I knew better. I knew that was not the answer. So yeah. all of those lessons are in there and how I was able to navigate yeah. um, through life. And also, again, kind of understanding the broader public health implications of some of those those lessons that I had in my life. So it's a really, huh, it's a, I think it's, of course, a really good book because I wrote it. But I think people where, where have can, had. Where can we find the book? It's on Amazon. It is yeah. also on barnesandnoble.com. It is on Isawan um, Bookstore's website. And I actually even have copies here. If people are, are local to me and want to come pick one up. I've been doing drive-by uh, drop-offs. Like, come get this book. That's awesome. I'll sign it. Yeah. Yeah. And the book is called Fishing? Pushing Through. Pushing Through. Pushing Through. Finding the light in every lesson. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. Please go out and support her, you guys. Support her work. Um, get the book on Amazon. Um, can we get it on Kindle too? So it's available in, on the Kindle version and the paperback as well. And quick story about Kindle. A friend of mine texted me the other day and said, oh, I love having Alexa read the book to me. I said, Alexa can read? I had no idea that if you have a book on Kindle that Alexa will read the book to you. So That's you don't have to, to no me. audio book. Alexa will read it. That's news to me. Just like um, yesterday, uh, two days ago, one of the last guests I had on my show said, oh, I listened to our show on Alexa. I'm like, what? No. My I said, I only submitted my show to Amazon two days ago. They told me it was going to take two weeks. The same day I submitted it, they made it available on Amazon. Wow. And I thought he was joking. I got back. I said, Alexa, pull up the news with Obi podcast. Boom. <laughs> and she started talking. See, ain't that something? Ain't that something? So it's good that, you know, Amazon is really stepping up in that way. So that's, that's yes. amazing. Yeah. So yep. is, there, is there a social media page, a web page we can follow you at? Yes. I'm on Instagram at Nicole D. Vick. Um, okay. I have a website. I have a, at least I have my launch page up. So it's www.nicoledvitt.com and you can, you know, sign up to get on my mailing list um, and, you know, for updates and all that good stuff. I'm right. also on LinkedIn right. and, um, and on Facebook, I have my author page on Facebook, Nicole D. Vick, comma, author. Nice. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. You're all the way in LA and I know yeah. um, you're probably still at work and, but you made time to be on the show today. So I really, oh, I'm on vacation. I'm on vacation this week. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for all you do for the community. Thank you for being a public health advocate. Thank you for being a, a an instructor, a teacher, Thank you for the book. Thank you for being a black woman, an exemplary black woman. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And for everybody tuning in, this will live on Facebook. It will also live on YouTube. It's streaming live on both locations right now. But by tomorrow, I will have it on podcast. Now you can tell Alexa to plug the music over you so you don't have to do it. Yeah, so it's on Spotify. It's on Apple Music. It is now on Amazon. So Thank you. Um, the news with Obi runs on donations. If you feel, feel it in your heart to throw me a little something, people watching, please do. I'll appreciate it. But other than that, thank you. Go out, vote, wear your mask, please. And please. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good night.